Hello, my name is Tommy. I'm Ian. And we're going to be talking today about Kirchhoff's theorem. So, Kirchhoff's theorem is a geometry theorem that was formulated about a hundred years ago by a Hungarian mathematician named Kirchhoff. And what this theorem states concerns a unit circle and a certain kind of polygon that's inside the unit circle. So first, just to review, a unit circle is a circle that has a radius of 1. Okay? And when you put a polygon inside the circle, and the way we're going to do it, that's called inscribing, which means is that each corner of our polygon is going to touch each corner of the circle. So, the polygon we'll be working with is called a dodecagon, which means it has 12 sides. So, and what's more, it's going to be a regular dodecagon. So let me go ahead and draw it as best I can. And then we will have a look at what we're dealing with. So a regular dodecagon has 12 sides. All of them are the same. And what's more, all of the angles right here, are also going to be the same. So, there is our dodecagon. Now, Kirchhoff's theorem talks about the area of this dodecagon as compared with the area of the circle. Now, you probably know from geometry that if we have a circle with radius 1, the area is going to equal pi times the radius squared. But since our radius is just 1, this area is going to equal pi, which is about 3.14. So, if you were to look at this dodecagon and maybe estimate kind of what the area should be, well, you see we've got all these little spaces in here, so it should be a little bit less than the area of the circle. And since we know the area of the circle is 3.14, you might guess that the area of this dodecagon is going to be somewhere around 3. And so this is what Kirchhoff's theorem says, is that the area of this dodecagon is exactly 3. So, how are we going to show this? Well, first off, we're going to need to know what this angle is. Since it's the same all the way around, that's going to be very useful. So here's where another result from geometry comes into play. And that is, if we take any polygon, any polygon that has all of its points sticking out, it's got no cavities in it, like that. And then what we can do is we can take a line from one point and connect it to all of the other points that aren't next to it. And so, for the case of a four-sided polygon, we can cut this up into two triangles. And if we had a five-sided polygon, we'd be able to cut it into three triangles. Now, you probably know from your geometry that the angles inside a triangle all add up to 180 degrees. And we're going to use that fact a lot in these next couple minutes. So, the angle, the total angle around this whole thing is going to equal precisely all of the angles inside each of these triangles. But here we have two triangles, so for a four-sided figure, the total angle around the outside is going to be 2 times 180 degrees, which will equal 360. Now for a five-sided figure, we have three triangles. And so what that will mean is that it will equal 3, times 180, so the total angle around the edges of this polygon on the inside will equal 540 degrees. And so, if we're looking at a 12-sided polygon, a dodecagon, well, we can draw a point from here and draw triangles to every point except for the two next to it. So we can draw 10 triangles, so the total angles around this whole polygon, this dodecagon, will be 10 times 180 degrees, which will equal 1,800 degrees. Now, 
So now that we know that, how can we find the area of one of these? Well, we know that they're all the same. So all we have to do is take 1800 divided by 12, and what we end up with is 150 degrees. So each of these angles is going to be 150 degrees. And that, that's going to be important here in a minute. And one thing that we should also mention is that this figure is very symmetrical. You know, all these angles are the same, all these sides are the same. So what that means is that if we can show that something is true for this angle, that means it's true for every single other one of these angles, because they're all the same. And so that issue of symmetry is also going to be important here. So now we have to think about this area problem. So, one of the techniques that Kirchhoff used here was that he took something that was really complicated, a dodecagon inscribed inside a circle, and he found ways to make it easier. So, if we're dealing with area, the area of a circle is kind of complicated. It has to do with, you know, pi, and pi is a weird number. So, what we're going to do is instead of using this circle, and this is what Kirchhoff decided to do, let me write this over here so we have room, is he said, all right, let's draw a square that touches the circle once at each side. Because it will be a lot easier for us to talk about the area of a square than a circle. So, if this is a unit circle, that means this length from here to here, or from here to here, is 1. Which means that one side of this square is 2. So what's the area of this square? Well, it's 2 times 2, which is 4. Now, as far as numbers are concerned, 4 is a lot easier to deal with than pi. So what we're going we're gonna to do here is we're not even going to worry about this circle much anymore. We're going to worry about the square, because it's easier to work with. Now, let's take this one step further. Who knows how to find the area of a dodecagon? Kind of complicated. So but what we can do here is we can break up this dodecagon into simpler pieces. And from there, we can find exactly what we need. All right, as uh, Tommy said, um, yeah, can, can it see me? Yeah, you're good. As Tommy said, um, Kirchhoff's theorem is all about taking something that's rather difficult to deal with, this dodecagon, and breaking it into simple, easy to deal with parts. And as Tommy actually already did, um, I, I already showed you, um, one of the easiest shapes to break things down in to, um, and you probably know this from your geometry classes, is a triangle. So we're going to break this into triangles. Now, the most obvious way, and you guys have almost certainly done this before, um, is to put a point at that circle that I just erased radius, right, which means that it's going to be equal distance, e equal distance from all of these corners, um, and just draw a line. And then draw another line. And we're going to have 12 triangles. Keep in mind that this, these are not the same triangles that Tommy used to determine the measure of an interior angle. These are just, um, these are triangles to the center, not from one corner to all the others. Alright, so when you're done, unless you've done something wrong, you should have 12 triangles. Now, uh, since, since these points are all on the same circle, and this point is the radius of that circle, we know that all of these lines are, are the same, which means that these triangles are what we call isosceles, meaning that these sides are the same, they're actually one, because they're the radius of that circle, um, 
and these angles are going to be the same. And since these angles are made up of 150 degrees, um, uh, each one of these angles is 150 degrees. When we divide it in two, each of these are 75 degrees. Now that won't come up on its own, but that'll be useful in a second. Okay, so that's that's a lot easier to deal with 12 triangles than, than a dodecagon, but we want to simplify it even further. Um, so we know the um, radius of this circle, and while we don't really care what it is, we can't really get away from the side length of this dodecagon. So while I'm not really going to worry about what it is right now, I am going to break this triangle into uh, two shapes. This triangle, which is equilateral, um, all of the sides of this triangle are um, equal to the side length of the dodecagon. So I'm going to call this 60. Uh, if you remember from your geometry classes, uh, the all of the angles in a um, equilateral triangle are 60 degrees, um, and that makes this angle right here because the whole angle is 75. We just figured that out. Um, that makes this angle 15. Now that's very important in a second. Um, well, our whole goal in breaking it down into triangles was to make it simpler. This doesn't look simpler because now we have a triangle, a big triangle, and this quadrilateral thing here. So uh, that just means that it's a four-sided shape. So I'm just going to draw a line here and connect the radius to this point um, and see what happens. Okay, so we know that this is 60, and these two degrees plus 60 um, have to be 180. 360. Um, uh, 360, excuse me. Um, so 360 minus 60 equals 2 times whatever that angle is. Um, angle. And so we get that that angle equals 150 degrees. Well, that's interesting because um, we know that all the angles in a triangle add up to uh, 180 degrees. So 15 degrees plus 150 uh, plus whatever that other angle is, um, let's call it x, equals 180 degrees. When you subtract 165 from 180, you get x equals, oh, excuse me, drew an extra line there, uh, equals 15 degrees. Well, that means that just like these triangles out here, this triangle is, um, is isosceles, and the sides are going to be the side length of the dodecagon. So now we've got the, uh, ever, uh, the dodecagon, you can do this 12 times for each of these triangles. Now we've got the dodecagon in terms of the side length of the dodecagon, and the unit radius, which is 1. Well, um, if you notice, we said that this is 150, right? Um, and it stands to reason that this divide, that this is equal to this, because the side lengths uh, that they're against are equal. Well, let's see what that angle is. So, you subtract 150 
from 180 because this has to make a f straight line and that equals 30 which is 2 of this over 2 which equals 15 degrees um, and that's interesting because over here we have um, 15 degrees with a side on uh, with on one side the side length of the dodecagon and on the other side the unit radius of one. Well, that side is one. We know that because it, uh, the square has a total side length of two, and that side is obviously the side length of the dodecagon. So we can say that those triangles are the same. Um, the, the drawing kind of fell apart, but that's okay because we did it very quickly. I've got a nice drawing for you in just a second. Um, Three, four, five, six um, of the red isosceles triangles and one, two, three equilateral triangles. And then Outside of the dodecagon, but in the square, there are two more isosceles triangles, eight total, and then one more equilateral triangle, uh, making a total of four. And that's just a fourth of the square. So, when we multiply it to cover the whole square, because if you notice, this is only a fourth of the square, um, Inside the dodecagon, we have 24 isosceles triangles and 12 equilateral. Um, and then inside the square, we have 8 times 4, which is 32 isosceles triangles and 16 equilateral triangles. And um, if you notice, we're still, we, we don't seem to be any closer to our end goal than we started, but we actually are almost done. Um, we haven't done any calculation with area for the dodecagon yet, um, and all we have are these triangles. So the only areas we have ca calculated are the circle and the square. So we either need to start figuring out the areas of these triangles, which doesn't sound very pleasant. I don't want to do that. You probably don't either. Um, or we need something relating the area of the dodecagon to the area of the square. Well, if you notice, if you divide what's in the square by what's in the dodecagon, this gives you uh, 4 over 3, and this gives you the same thing, which means that there are four-thirds as many uh, triangles in the dodecagon as there are in the square, there, uh, for both kinds of uh, triangles. And the fact that this consistency exists means that we can relate the area of the square back to the area of the dodecagon. So, we have these triangles that are all congruent, and I don't think, I, I don't think you should think either, um, that these, the area of these triangles is going to change. In fact, it stays consistent through the whole thing. So, since there are three-fourths, I just flipped the fraction, as many triangles in the dodecagon, uh, triangles in the dodecagon as there are in the square, you can say that three-fourths times the area of the square is equal to the area of the dodecagon. So, we know the area of the square. Uh, we calculated that earlier. It's just two times two which is 4. And then we multiply that by 3 fourths, and we should get 3, which is exactly what Kershaw said.
So look at what we managed to do here. Beautiful. Without doing any calculations, we just found the area of a 12-sided polygon inscribed inside a circle. Now it's kind of impressive, but let's think about how we did this. So the first thing we did, if you come back over here, was we decided that the circle was going to be too hard to deal with. So instead we replaced it with a square because we're dealing with area. And squares are nicer than circles when it comes to area. Because we got a nice area of 4 for the square. And what else that meant is that we could start drawing some of these triangles that we did. And because we could get the same triangles inside the dodecagon as we got outside the dodecagon, that means that we could find the relationship between the area of the square and of the dodecagon. So when we came over here, we saw, in fact, that the dodecagon had three quarters of the triangles that the square had, and so that it had to have three quarters of the area. And since we already knew the area to be four, all we had to do was put the numbers in and find that the area of the dodecagon is exactly three. So that was, that was the brilliant thing Kirchhoff did. He took a complicated problem. He used the fact that he could change things that were difficult into something simpler by breaking them down or replacing with a square. And he got a problem that was not only kind of cool to look at, but that was easy to deal with. And that is Kirchhoff's theorem. Thank you for watching.